Buonasera, benvenuti, good evening everyone. I promise this is in English, don't you worry. <laughs> I'm Antonio Zapula, I'm CEO of the Thomson Reuters Foundation, where we work to strengthen free, fair and informed societies using media and legal interventions. And it's a real pleasure to be in this beautiful venue in such great company uh, today. Uh, and thank you for being here. I know it's beautiful outside, but we're not going to be disappointing you. It's going to be a fantastic session. We're going to be talking about the many challenges that journalists face today. And the list, unfortunately, is very long. We're going to be talking about legal attacks, physical attacks, online attacks, police repression, financial pressures, the erosion of trust, and polarization of society. And it's precisely because this list is really long that we could argue that indeed the profession of journalists is an endangered profession. And so it's important that this risk is understood by the people that consume news, but also by legislators and by international institutions. And because it's important to understand that any attempt against, you know, any attempt to silence journalists is an attempt to erode our democracy. And this is why attacks against journalists as a profession should be con concerned, concerning all of us, should be considered as an issue of concern for all of us. So I'm here in the pleasure, I'm in the pleasure of being uh, with Ronan Farrow, who's the executive producer of Endanger, uh, Patricia Campos Melos, who's a journalist at Foglia di San Paolo, Joel Simon, who's the director of the Journalism Protection Initiative at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism, part of City University of New York. Joel was the executive director of CPJ from 26, 2006 to 2021. Uh, and obviously Rachel Grady, who's uh, one of the co-directors of Endangered. So Ron, I would like to start with you because uh, the documentary really highlights uh, a number of uh, risks faced by journalists by the lived, you know, through the lived experiences of journalists in Brazil, in the US, in Mexico. You are an investigative reporter and clearly you have faced and experienced some of these issues yourself. How much of that experience has led to the documentary? Well, first of all, thank you for the work that you do on this issue, and thank you to everyone here in this audience. It's always so reassuring, especially for those of us as journalists, as documentarians, as people who work on these issues, to be in a room full of peers who are so accomplished and who care and want to break through the set of interconnected problems you just mentioned. For sure, I think I probably speak for all of us who are involved in this film, this came from seeing these issues firsthand in our lives, in different ways, in our different careers. For me, as an investigative reporter in the States, I was always very conscious of the fact that I was in a fortunate position in terms of my personal safety. And nevertheless, even though we have a decent framework, I would not claim flawless, <laughs> for rule of law, and even though we have the protections of our constitution, which does enshrine journalism as an important cornerstone of our democracy, and that of course is not the case everywhere in the, the world, what I faced in pursuing various confronting stories that pissed off various people with a lot of resources was considerable blowback. And that comes in many forms. It, it came, in my case, uh, in the form of surveillance at times, uh, you know, old-fashioned human intelligence operations where I was getting staked out and followed around and so forth. It came in terms of uh, threats using the legal system. Uh, thankfully, I'm at a publication, The New Yorker, that is incredibly meticulous about fact-checking. And so there's never been a case where anyone has had a lever to actually use those kinds of mechanisms meaningfully, but you can still have malign actors in the United States using the legal system to shake down and harass journalists. It happens all the time. And I think because I had dealt with those kinds of tactics, I had dealt with in some cases uh, the use of the press as a, a forum in which to sort of smear and try to impugn journalists and, and the work that they're doing. I, I had two feelings about it, one of which was I had to step outside of my comfort zone and my default, which I think probably a lot of us in this room have, uh, expectation that, that I shouldn't be the story and come to a place where I was comfortable sharing some of that in a way that hopefully wasn't aggrandizing but, but gave meaningful insight to so many colleagues who, who go through so many similar uh, obstacles to do their work. 
And then the, the second thought that I had about those experiences was the comparative point I made, that around the world, so many journalists that I've been in touch with, including in places I've worked over the course of my career, uh, you know, if you're a journalist in, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, uh, if you're a journalist in Belarus or Russia, uh, y you're quite possibly winding up dead if you're pissing people off in the way that some of my work has. And so I wanted to take the opportunity to talk about and, and look at people who are experiencing the challenges in the States. And then I also wanted to make sure that we were humanizing the stories of journalists around the world going through this and, and looking at the very different stakes because I think no matter where we live, we do depend on the work of people like Patricia to inform us about our cultures, our democracies, uh, to create accountability. And look, in the States, it might be less likely that a journalist who does that work winds up dead. But, but the problems we see in the places where the profession carries a deadly risk are very rapidly coming home to us in the United States as well. So this, this is a shared problem. I had that impression. And then I was really honored to be able to crack into and be in a support role on the, this challenge of how do we tell those stories around the world. And thankfully, there were incredible journalists who were willing to let us stick cameras in their faces as they went through these, these difficult dynamics. And we'll talk about some of those challenges also from the production point of view, given that it, obviously the documentary was filmed at a very interesting time. But you talked about humanizing the stories and the professionalism of the, of, of, of the journalist. Patricia, you obviously uh, in the documentary. Um, and we talked about several, Ron just mentioned several level of challenges. Obviously, you experience legal challenges. We're going to be talking about that in a moment. But I think watching the documentary, one of the most pressing challenges, perhaps, is that you really experience uh, this direct attacks by the president. You've been openly vilified at the time, the president of Brazil. I would like to show a soundbite from Endangered and then we'll come back to you. Yes, I think it's coming. <laughs> That's the president of the country saying that a journalist wanted to give her hole in exchange for information against him. And it's part of the strategy to discredit uh, journalists, especially women. It's like everybody feels authorized to harass me. Prostitute called Patricia Campos Melo works in the whorehouse Folha de São Paulo. Sex in journalism. Everything for a hole. Do you want my hole? Random people sending me messages saying, so how much do you charge to fuck me? You should be raped. We Bolsonarians do not accept prostitution in our ranks. It's hard to watch every time, and I really thank you for being here and doing this because it must be particularly hard for you to watch it. But there is so much in that soundbite and so many questions that, that come to mind. First of all, whether it's got better now that Bolsonaro is no longer in power. I also want you to know whether that online harassment that you experienced ever translated into real life threats. And also what kind of support you got from Foglia de San Paulo and the wider community of, of journalists. Um, thank you, Antonio, and thank you, everyone, and for this beautiful place. Um, things are better, yes. Uh, I was saying the other day that uh, we can do journalism, like normal journalism, you know, you're being critical about the government if they do something that deserves criticism, and you don't get rape threats because of that, <laughs> or porn videos with your face, so... Yes, I know that's a very low bar, but it's, it's good to have to cover uh, a normal government again. Um, and I think the crazy thing about the internet, I mean, I'm not comparing anything that my colleagues in Nicaragua, Venezuela, or the Ukraine are going through. I mean, 
we're really we're safe in that sense, right? You cannot compare. Um, but the fact that it's a democracy and uh, politicians are weaponizing uh, social media and the internet to discredit journalists and many, many people who read that or who get those memes or their messages, they believe it. Um, I've had so many experiences in real life of people who probably saw some fake news about me or a fake picture like my... I mean, now it's funny because I laugh, but I mean, it wasn't really funny for many. My neighbor, uh, next door neighbor, uh, first floor, every time I would walk, she would open the window and yell, you communist slut. My neighbor, <laughs> right? It's my neighbor. And people would come up in the street and say, this is horrible, everything you're doing against the president, and you're a communist. So, of course, there were threats against my son, you know, um, uh, I, I needed security for a while. But the, the really uh, strange thing is, how do people believe in that? You know? Like, they, they think um, it's not a job, it's just like you're inventing stuff, and, and, and they believe those memes. So, um, um, again, I had the privilege, I, I uh, had legal assistance uh, in that as well. Um, psychological. Uh, many of my colleagues in Brazil go through similar things. I mean, it's a very common thing against women journalists. Uh, I would like to mention two colleagues, Vera Magalhães and Miriam Leitão, who were also targeted. Like, they had like pictures of them in protests, like, you should target this woman. Um, and that's, I mean, it gets to a point that um, you kind of... I mean, I don't know if there's going to be a crazy person who's going to be throwing a bottle at me in the street, you know. Now things are much better, uh, and I hope they stay this way. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm not sure if I answered. Thank you, Patricia. I, I just want to add to that. <coughs> It's so brave what Patricia is doing in this conversation. The work itself is already so difficult and so important. And I think that realizing that talking openly about these painful experiences is also important and can help us all as a profession address these kinds of threats, these forms of harassment that should never take place, uh, that's a real service. You know, I, I was so grateful, as I mentioned, when she was willing to do this film, and uh, you know, I hope I hope you all are able to to watch. Uh, Rachel and my colleague Heidi did incredible work directing it, and every journalist on screen made a sacrifice to tell those stories, just as Patricia is now Absolutely. telling us about it here. Absolutely, Joel. Another aspect that is documented in Endangered is this uh, increase in police attacks against journalists. Obviously, you have tons of experience given what you do and what you've done as CPJ. I wanted to bring another clip and then come to you uh, for some comments. Can we please play this next soundbite? going on you know I've been I've been sort of processing this moment in this film and uh, you know one of the things I was remembering is when 
um, Rachel and Heidi Ewing, who's here as co-director, came to me and Ronan as well uh, when I was at CPJ. And you know, the the original idea was to kind of be a, do a sort of fly on the wall uh, uh, documentary of you know what it was like inside the Committee to Protect Journalists to defend journalists under threat around the world. And then and then and then COVID happened, and the story changed, and our lives changed, and everything changed. And, and I think that, you know, we're still sort of processing that moment. You, the, 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 I think the documentary ended up being the most incredible, like, historic document of what that experience was like, of first being confined, I mean, experiencing this simultaneously, all of us around the world, and then the efforts by repressive governments and democratic governments to undermine public understanding of the health risks and, the, and, and the, the implications of this disease that was sweeping the world. And in that effort to kind of tell that story, journalists were on the front line. Journalists like Patricia, if you, you know, if you watch the documentary, you'll see that she was out there in Brazil really you know, documenting what was happening in the hospitals. And then, and then what happened, and this is you know, sort of a roundabout way of getting to what this clip shows, is that you know, the, t the moment, not just in the United States, but around the world, that people sort of came out of their homes collectively to reconnect was around politics, and it was around protest. And there were different aspects of this protest, but you'll recall that like after you know, six months into the pandemic, people started coming out into the street to express their political feelings. And journalists were instrumental to our ability to kind of process and understand what was happening. And around the world, journalists were in the firing lines. I mean, you saw that in the United States. There were systematic attacks on journalists. There were 129 journalists arrested in the United States covering the, pro the protests that erupted after the murder of George Floyd. There were 400, more than 400 journalists attacked, 80% of them by police. This is actually something I've been researching since I left CPJ as part of a new report that will be coming out soon. So it just, I mean, I think it connects with Patricia's experience. What Rodin was uh, describing is this was something we experienced collectively and the role of journalists and the battle over who controlled the narrative around COVID was another front line in the pandemic. And Rachel, obviously we've seen police brutality, but through the documentary, you really see crowds, angry crowds, lashing at our journalists. You see MAGA political rallies, mass protests, you know, ICU moments, which we'll show in a minute. As a director, uh, and Heidi, by the way, the co-director is, is, is here in the room. Heidi, I don't know where you are, but here we go. Good to see you. Um, were you prepared as directors to, to this level of risks? Obviously, I guess you planned the, the documentary before you knew the pandemic would hit. How do you manage the risk for the other documentary makers that are in the room? Well, I think that um, journalists always take risks. That is, not, that, that is not new. That is something that kind of comes with the job. Um, I think the fact that there was a plague that started up um, definitely added that level of harm. Um, but, you know, it wasn't really, once, once it was really, really dangerous, it was more dangerous, it was more relevant. The whole movie was. It kind of made our point. So, you know, and our, we had to find reporters that were still reporting out on the street, and they were doing it, so we were doing it. And, um, you know, I think that... Um, it, w it comes with the job. It comes with the job. Usually it doesn't come with my job, but it did come with my job this time too, because that was their job. Ronan, um, we saw angry crowds in the documentary. There is this idea of trust being broken between the consumers of news and the journalists. Some statistics, you know, this was also referred several times here at Perugia this week, actually indicate that an increasing number of people around the world believe that journalists are intentionally misleading the public. How did we get here? Well, this isn't unique to journalism, right? Over the last 20 years around the world, certainly in the United States, we've seen a, a plummeting in trust in institutions. That is just a, a moment in history that we're living through. And a whole lot of factors that we don't have time to get into today feed into that. I think it's important to clock and to all be in a conversation about the, the subset of that that is about declining trust in the news media. 
And I think there are things that we can do to try to counterbalance that. The numbers in the United States are really daunting right now. The Gallup does a poll every year about this. Uh, and there are a couple of interesting insights. I mean, the, the headline is that, as you say, the trust isn't there. Uh, a little bit over a quarter of the American population uh, has a positive view of news media at this point. More than half of the American public now has a negative view of uh, news media. That's a lot to contend with. And that collides with a moment where social media platforms are a petri dish for misinformation where a rising tide of authoritarian politics in a number of places around the world, including in the United States, seeks to, to weaponize this mistrust in the media and to revive old authoritarian tropes about the press being the enemy of the people, the press deliberately misleading the people. Um, and, and of course, it's, it's all happening at a time when the business models for our profession are so in flux and in crisis. You know, I'm very fortunate to make TV and, and film content for HBO, a platform that you know, does have resources to write for The New Yorker, which has figured out pretty idiosyncratically a way to make subscriber revenue sustainable. But that's not the norm. And one of the things that we all felt it was important to capture in this film was the collision of those issues. The, Miami Herald photojournalist we follow living through the shrinking of that newspaper's newsroom uh, as the crowds get angrier, as you suggested, uh, as the misinformation becomes more rank, more pervasive. So uh, there's a, a rich debate to be had about what the response to that should be, but I think we all need to approach our coverage with awareness of that. And we all need to approach this project of solving the, for the business model, figuring out ways of making it sustainable with knowledge of that situation. Personally, I think the, the, the answer in the broadest sense is always gonna be on the, the positive side of the ledger. You're not gonna take away the market that's out there for sensationalist misinformation. You're not gonna root out and fix the way that sensationalism manifests in, for instance, American cable news that's very partisan, that's very opinion driven. Um, but what you can do, and I don't just mean the royal you, I mean all of us here in this room, is build better coverage and do stories that are tough and that maybe require risk, but that are also meticulous and, and build that trust. And it's really hard and it takes time and it's really bruising because as you do it, people are gonna try to discredit you because they're mad about the work. And, and it involves constant self-searching too because none of us are perfect machines either. You know, we're, we're gonna take those risks, we're gonna try to tell the story in the most fair and rounded way possible and we're gonna hope that we don't get it wrong. And, and every tiny uh, aspect of this kind of reporting that is confronting in this way is gonna be scrutinized. Is, there's gonna be well-resourced efforts to demolish it if there are real stakes to, to the stories you're telling. So, you know, you have to kind of armor up for battle and you have to always, always live by that commitment to getting it right and, and you have to keep at it. And I think that if we all do that personally and we all engage in the project of building the business structures around that, we've got a shot at counterbalancing the numbers that we're talking about. Talk about the importance of keep going with tough stories that require a lot of effort and a lot of resources. And some of those resources are clearly legal. And we've been talking about this topic quite a lot this, this week. And Patricia, you experienced directly significant legal threats and believe you're still fighting two legal battles. Can you tell us more? Sure. Um, I think as, as many other colleagues uh, spoken in other panels, I think it's, it's part of this package. Um, first thing, um, many of us, we're not public people, right? I mean, I'm, I, was a, I am a print reporter. I used to cover migration, conflict. So first the thing is make you a public person and uh, discredit you. Then there's the financial pressure. So 
sometimes governments themselves or um, businessmen who are you know close to the government and I know that happens in Turkey that happens in Hungary that happens everywhere start suing you um, and this is I mean it, it's really um, terrifying to wake up and say okay I'm being sued for two million I've never seen that money in my whole life what if I have you know I mean it's uh, so again, I have the privilege that I have a job and I have legal assistance for, for many uh, freelance journalists. That's really, um, it silences journalists because the person says, I'm not going to investigate this because I know this guy is just suing everyone and I don't have a lawyer. And many times when you're not, you know, uh, an employee of, you know, media outlet, you, you don't have a, a lawyer. So I think that's, that's a, a very um, serious thing. And those, those uh, uh, legal threats that you received were, just, just to contextualize for the wider audience, because we're going to delve a little bit more into that in a second with Joel, those were not the classic uh, defamation lawsuits, right? You received also ac accusations of uh, financial misleading. I mean, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Or what was the no. situation with yours? Uh, no, they didn't have that idea yet. I hope they don't get that idea. <laughs> <laughs> no. So it was purely they were, on defamation grounds. They were, yes, they were all defamation okay. for a lot of money and like, for you to have an idea, like stories I did using uh, our Freedom of Information Act, I'm being sued for that, it's like official documents. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's a very random, but I don't think they're doing like they're doing with Maria Ressa and with uh, Jimmy Lai and other people. No. Because Joel, that's a trend that we are seeing. We we released a report that Foundation Tom Sorter's Foundation, the Tau Center, precisely on this changing landscape of uh, of legal tactics that are used to be you know that, to attack journalists. Can you tell us more about the changing landscape? Of well, I mean, I think I think you know I think. Um, Patricia alluded to, you know, what it feels like to face legal action um, as a journalist. I mean, and I think it, it operates on, you know, as our, as our report showed, on multiple levels. I mean, the first is um, it's, it's you, you worry about your, you know, you know how you're going to defend yourself. I mean, you know, and even if you have a publication that has um, a, a lawyer and legal support, you know, you're spending a lot of time dealing with lawyers that you could be spending doing journalism, and you have a lot of um, anxiety. And, and that's, a big, that's a big challenge to deal with. And then what, the other thing that happens is the public nature of the accusation does, uh, does something in the online space. It triggers people who start attacking you. So now you're dealing with a lawsuit, you're dealing with, you know, how you're going to defend yourself, and you're dealing with reams, uh, you know, terrible online uh, abuse and, and harassment that is, can, can be absolutely crippling. And so that's, that's like in, in, a, in a kind of classic um, kind of legal action that governments take against journalists. But you alluded to the thing that we're seeing, like, thank God, Patricia, you didn't have to deal with this, but we're seeing this around the world, is governments are now moving beyond the traditional kinds of like defamation and slap suits and those sorts of things to making like wild, unfounded uh, accusations. It could be something like what we saw in the Evan Gershkovich case of like espionage, or it could be something like what I just, I was just in Guatemala and I visited a journalist who's in jail there who's accused of like just made up charges of money laundering. And then you take, you know, it takes it to another level because it's a f false accusation. So you can't even defend yourself and the, whole, and the resources of the state are mobilized against you. In, and the judges are, and the prosecutors and the whole system is controlled by the government and they're right against you. So it's, it's really a devastating experience. And uh, unfortunately, as a report showed, and, and Antonio, this, this is a phenomenon that's on the rise. The report, by the way, if you want to read it, is at medialegalattacks.com. Um, Ronan, you also experienced some of these uh, legal threats. How did it feel for you? How were you able to fend them off? Well, Joel is right to touch on the mental health implications. And this is another area where I think it's often hard for us as reporters to talk about this side of it. You know, I. I am more public than most of my colleagues, and that might make it appear to be easier for me, but I, I think actually it makes it harder in some ways for me, or, or makes me more reluctant. Um, I feel like I'm constantly trying to keep the focus on the work, which is so precious, and which 
involves sources who are often living through higher stakes than I am. Uh, and I, I'm constantly in a posture of trying to not be a distraction from that. A and yet, I think it, it's really critical that we all talk about the personal devastation and the personal chilling effect on the work that can result from these kinds of tactics. I mean, in my own experience, I, I've had the legal threats come at me every which way. Um, to, to give one example that's been in the news recently, a few years ago I did a series of stories on Donald Trump's relationship with the National Enquirer, an American tabloid, and their parent company, AMI, uh, and, and documented a series of uh, hush payments during uh, that American presidential election. And, you know, they were complicated stories to report. They involved really tracking down these contracts and following a trail of money. Uh, it, there was a complicated editorial conversation to be had because they tended to be hush payments to cover up inconsequential personal activity affairs, you know, an alleged love child, um, you know, rumor mongering stuff that nevertheless led to transactions that I was convinced were real news because they had very likely violated election law, right? These were undeclared payments uh, as part of a conspiracy essentially to keep information away from the voting public, to defraud voters. Uh, and, and so it felt important. And the thing I encountered in that specific story and the reason I'm giving the example is you know, there was a tabloid entity that had historically been in the business of smearing people. And they really came after me, you know. They, I became like an all caps, like, you know, yellow Enquirer headline, like, villain in, in their pages. And it was a lot of really bruising personal stuff. It was like, you know, s sending people after me to, to seduce me, to try to get compromise. And, and then it was also for several years, uh, some of those guys associated with the Enquirer just sending complete shakedown threats, like pay us $50 million overnight or, you know, we're going to drain you dry by dragging you through a frivolous lawsuit. You know, we're going to file. And it, those threats actually came at a moment in this volatile conversation about trust in the media, which is very partisan and politicized in the United States where actually the conversations I had with litigators were like, yeah, there's absolutely no grounds for anything other than something incredibly frivolous here. And in some parts of the United States, that would be considered a you know, slap suit and you could get rid of it very quickly. But in the right state where they don't have those anti-slap laws, uh, and because of this moment in history where some of those guys around Donald Trump were also tied to wider, anti-media activism um, and were kind of rolling the, the very clinical nonpartisan investigative work that I was doing into a conversation about the supposed, uh, you know, leftist media. A and the lawyers that were part of that activism were frankly so kind of crazy. <laughs> like they had a history of cases, which I won't get into, but defending real, real hardline alt-right types going after the media that what I was told was like, yeah, with most people in most times, there, there's no chance anyone would file something like this. It's just a shakedown to kind of scare you and make you um, feel that anxiety Joel is talking about and, and to have a chilling effect in the work. But in that case, I really did have to kind of set up my life and take the meetings assuming that they might go forward with it because there was such a confluence of a crazy time and crazy people who were in the business of going too far in the name of those anti-press beliefs. And, and that was really scary, you know, because there was no chance that anyone was going to prevail in a suit. And, you know, that would obviously be the case with the threats that Patricia gets too. But you have to stare down the very real possibility that there's going to be maybe multiple years until, until this is thrown out. And, and I'm not a person who has the resources to necessarily survive that financially. Um, and, and I'm operating from a position of more strength than most people who deal with those threats. More financial security because I work in TV and not just in, in print. Uh, more public profile, which as we discussed is a double-edged sword, makes you more of a target, but also is protective in some ways. 
Uh, and I, I was very conscious as I was kind of trying not to fall apart psychologically in the crosshairs of some of those threats and, and others like them at, at other moments in my career. Uh, of the fact that there is a big population of my peers and colleagues out there going through this without any of that framework uh, or support or resources. A and so it made me want to talk about and highlight those threats more and I'm so glad Patricia was willing to open up about her experiences and let us capture them for the film because it's not discussed enough. We do kind of try to have a stiff upper lip in this profession uh, and, and don't always display our vulnerability about it. But of course the reality is if you are terrified and like you get into a pattern of anxiety where you're afraid to look at your phone because it might be this kind of a threat, it, it, that, that is going to have a chilling effect on the work. And, and that means the kinds of malign actors who use these kinds of shady tactics are winning. And, Yes, and by dragging it out into the spotlight and putting sunlight on it, I do think that we can disincentivize that kind of bad behavior. Absolutely, and we talked a lot about that during, during this week. Also, the, you know, the role that journalists themselves have in making sure that they don't amplify uh, cases in which you know, they end up you know, adding more mad to the reputation, for example, of a journalist that's been discredited, accused of corruption, money laundering. Etc. Rachel, I want to talk to you about news deserts. There is a really interesting part of the documentary that shows the impact uh, of news deserts and how some of the people perceive this risk or, or not. Can we, play the can we play the next clip, please? So the paper in Youngstown, the Vindicator, closed down recently, meaning that Youngstown is now the biggest city in America without a local newspaper. Were you upset by that? No, it's just a sign of the times. They're a dying industry because they are so left-wing progressives. We are not left-wing progressives. So we stopped buying the newspaper. We stopped them just having one point of view, the Democrats. Why are they going to pay for a paper that calls me on kinds of names because I'm a conservative Republican? That's why they're a dying industry. Don't you think, though, that the, this community has a right to have accountability journalism in it, though? Because that's what that, the function of that paper was. It was to hold the powerful to account. No, I, I don't believe they did. I'm not going to buy a newspaper that doesn't reflect my views. All right. Pretty honest. <laughs> so what happens to a country that doesn't have strong local papers? <clears throat> well, that's a great question. Um, I think... Um, Misinformation obviously probably increases. Um, I think, uh, you know, elected officials get away with more stuff. Um, and I, I, we're seeing it really in, very intensely in America, what's happening. Um, that's why I was hoping, what I was hoping when I made this film, for, you know, what, what we could add to the conversation would maybe, it would be a recruiting tool you know, humanize these people, show that, you know, that this is an interesting, exciting job, although it looks hard, you know, we made it look hard, because it is, but um, that it's a calling, I find it to be a calling, I'm not a, I, I'm not a journalist, I'm a documentary filmmaker, that's my calling, journalists, that's their calling, and we need more people um, to join, to join the cause, you know, I think that that would help with the, with the deserts in the United States. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that people, that young people see this film and want to go do it. That's one of my favorite clips, by the way. Um, Patricia, moving back to you, um, we want to talk about COVID. We spoke earlier with Rachel about also the risks of filming this documentary during COVID. Um, you clearly have seen this firsthand. Again, let's play the next clip and then come back to you. Can we please play the next soundbite? Tá, 
É o salto com o número mais baixo que a qualidade. Tem número disso não? É isso que falou me dá real. Ah, você tá falando que ele falou? Não, 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 não. Talvez ele não tenha a situação de uma qualidade. Então a proporção real de, é, de óbito é muito, muito alta. Tenho certeza que a gente não pode passar pra vocês, mas essa é a realidade desse hospital. This was at a time when Bolsonaro was calling COVID a gripinha, a small, a small flu. Clearly, we're seeing the battle for control of the narrative playing really well there. How difficult it was for you to get the numbers? Well, yeah, that, that's something that came from the top, as you said. At one point, the Brazilian government had something they called the scoreboard of life. They would only uh, publish the figures of people who had survived COVID, uh, and they would hide the other numbers. Uh, we had to you know, look, and then they attempted to change the way statistics were uh, released. So it got to a point that all the media outlets, uh, we got together in a consortium to get our figures directly from the state governments, because that was the only way you could, so that in a sense, there was an incentive for, you know, directors or authorities in, in state public hospitals to hide their numbers. But there's only so much you can hide, right? I mean, you, you always have, you know, the epidemiologist who has uh, registered the figures, which was the case in, in that story, or, you know, a nurse who's seeing that people are not getting adequate care, care and that's why you know they're dying in high numbers but it was hard because there was an overall view that the government wanted to minimize the seriousness of uh, the disease because uh, uh, former president uh, bolsonaro had said himself if uh, you know there is a disease and it's serious the economy is going to go down and my government is going to go down so um, yes and if you imagine that we are doing this as many many colleagues were doing in the rest of the world at the same time as you're having you know porn montages of your face saying that you are whatever a, a prostitute or offering sex and you're like no i'm just doing my work you know i wake up i get my notebook and i go to the hospital and it's it's a regular job and we're just normal people so it was kind of crazy double reality and it's a courageous profession. I mean, we look back at those pictures, I think all of us remember the fear that we had. So going into a hospital, reporting for public interest at that time in those days, is definitely a very courageous thing to do on top of the other things that you've done. Can I just say something? Courageous is what journalists are doing in Ukraine. This is courageous. Absolutely. We were doing normal, normal reporting. Absolutely. Joel, you wrote a timely book after COVID called Infodemic. Uh, and you really look at how the spread of COVID went hand in hand with the spread of censorship. Uh, you look at China, you look at Russia, Egypt, but also the US. Where are we at in that journey? Have we seen some of these pressures disappearing or has it actually gotten worse? and we've forgotten about it. Well, I, I want to go back to the, the, the documentary because we, we were talking how like, this captured this incredibly powerful moment in history. And as COVID fades, and it's fading clearly, and you know, we, of course, we can't fade fast enough as far as we're all concerned. But I think we went through this you know, period of collective trauma, and now things seem normal to, to a certain extent, but the world is really different. I'm not quite sure how. I'm still processing it. As you said, I wrote a book about this, and so I should have some insights, but I, I, I have to acknowledge, you know, there's some things I've seen. I've seen like authoritarians consolidated power around the world and uh, consolidated control over the information space, and maybe we're emboldened by their ability to control information within their own country, so I, I, I think that that was a perception that Putin had, uh, you know, as he was 
you know, launching the invasion of U Ukraine. He probably thought that the, you know, the, the Europe was deeply divided in the aftermath of, of COVID politically, and maybe this was a, a moment when he could take advantage of that. She has consolidated power enormously in China and uh, used this, the, the, the massive surveillance that's been put in place to assert greater control and obviously feels emboldened and empowered in terms of his um, uh, actions towards uh, Taiwan. And, you know, democracy in India has eroded dr dramatically. It, it, it really sur it obviously survived but confronted an existential challenge in Brazil, which um, uh, Patricia documents and in the United States, which uh, many of us observed. So I, I think, like, I think the, 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 the documentary itself is a great moment to sort of pause and reflect on what we experienced and what happened uh, when leaders around the world, both in democracies and in authoritarian countries, sought to gain control over the narrative and over information, and we still don't realize, and, and we still haven't internalized the long-term impact that that's, that's having and, and will have. Bernard, what's your perspective from the U.S. covering the pandemic? You know, we saw Patricia working to ICUs, this control of the narrative. Obviously, something very interesting was happening at the time in the U.S. It, it was. I mean, we really saw misinformation flourish and a politicized effort to cover up what was happening. It's remarkable, the parallels between what was happening in Brazil, what was happening in, in Mexico, which is also chronicled in the film, what was happening in the United States, in so many places around the world. I mean, it, Italy had its moment with this too. I, I think that the fact that there is this backdrop of misinformation and the fact that we're coming out of this pandemic that was in some ways such a perfect crystallization of all of these problems. And thank God for the incredible work Rachel and, and Heidi did capturing that. In a moment where we weren't even sure if we were going to be able to capture anything, they really turned that challenge and liability into a virtue. Um, and, and, you know, I, I just want to say that we've talked a lot about the doom and gloom of that moment. And it's important to reflect on what we can learn from how challenging it has been and continues to be. But at the same time, I think one reason why the film strikes me as important and why I'm so proud of, of what these filmmakers did to communicate it, you can see in those clips the kind of the potency of the actual craft of filmmaking um, and, and the way in which it, without ever sensationalizing or glamorizing, conveys not just the lows, but the highs of the profession. The, the reason I think that's so important is part of the solution here is going to be making sure we all are, are fully engaged in and, and even kind of electrified by the prospect of being custodians of this important work of, of bringing people facts. And that the next generation of journalists feels the same way. You know, I, I'm so grateful every time I get to talk to rooms of young people, of students, who are, are looking at what, despite all of the challenges in the last five years or so, has been a, a moment of, of renaissance for investigative journalism. We have seen incredible work in all of our countries where journalists have taken those risks uh, where they have put in the hard work, but they've also outed really crucial truths. And, you know, even just to return to the, the small example I gave from my own work uh, in the last answer, like, that's a case where I, I dealt with a lot of shit and, you know, I'm going to be in therapy for a while about it, but, but also, like, that was the, the basis for a, a criminal indictment recently against Donald Trump. So the, the work does... <laughs> Exactly. I mean, I don't even mean to say that that's like uh, to opine on the case one way or the other, but the point is it's of consequence to get these facts out. We've seen that in Patricia's work, in every one of the journalists it, that we chronicle in the film, in many of the people in attendance at this conference. A and so I, I think one important thing that I want to make sure is not lost is the work is exciting. It's fulfilling. And you, you watch this film and... I, anyway, as a viewer, you know, I was just in a support role on this one. When I first watched the whole thing back with an audience, I really did want to kind of stand up and cheer. And I, I think it does capture that we are in a profession that is worth preserving, worth protecting, worth cheering for. Absolutely. And you mentioned the indictment, obviously, which is, uh, you know, when that happens, unfortunately, it doesn't happen all the time. That story leads to such a big impact. 
But we were talking earlier before, before the panel about truth and what happens also when facts are no longer perceived as facts. As an investigative reporter who investigates facts and put, puts facts out there, what's the perception of what you feel the facts, despite the effort and that you need to put in, in digging those facts out, in presenting those facts, and making the connections between dots, don't seem to be cutting through and don't seem to matter for the general public? This is one of the challenges of, of our profession, right? That not every story is going to have the marquee names, the accessible narrative, the emotional stakes that create a, a, a large space for it in the zeitgeist. And, you know, I think a lot about story selection, probably most of us in this business do, whether you're a documentarian or you're, you're writing for a newspaper. Um, I think a lot about the craft of how do you tell a story, in, not in a way that sensationalizes or sands off the edges of the truth, but that gives a rounded and full picture of the stakes in a way that hopefully will make people sit up and take notice. A and look, in those decisions, I don't harbor the illusion that I can always make everyone care uh, or, or, or create for a mainstream audience uh, about what are sometimes technical issues, um, that emotional connection that does propel the biggest stories in, into hearts and minds. And I actually deliberately try to go after a, a mix of topics and, and with a mix of techniques because I think it is as important that I do, you know, a story that very few people saw about a collaboration between the CIA and the FBI in my country to cover up the actual intelligence basis for uh, arrests of low-level drug runners uh, in the Caribbean. You know, there, there's stories like that where something is happening wrong legally, there's an injustice, people are suffering. In that case, there were uh, people who were imprisoned on the basis of false information. Um, but it's, you know, it's technical and it's a whistleblower story involving a really specific niche of the intelligence world. Um, and, and I really find, I'm just giving one specific example. There, there's a rhythm in my own work of stories that also are, are not going to take over the news media, but I still know that they are really important. And, and in that particular case that I'm referring to, you know, that did end up informing case law uh, in a way that was quieter, but I, I felt was important. And, and so I think not giving up on the stories that aren't going to grab as much attention is really important. And applying to both the kind of sexy marquee stories that you know are going to be so explosive and the ones that are quieter and more technical, the same commitment to illustrating the stakes and drawing the humanity out of it for people um, so that you can make it as comprehensible and as uh, freighted with importance for the average viewer or reader as possible, that's, that's really important and it, it's part of our job. We gotta, we gotta make people care as we do it. And Rachel, it's part of the odd job too, as a documentary filmmaker, we were talking about it earlier. We feel that we barely scratched the surface here. I, there's so many challenges that we're so in endangered. Do you plan on continuing working this, on, on this topic and who's gonna fund this work? It's not easy, it's a, not an easy documentary to um, do. I'm not gonna make another film about journalists, no. <laughs> this, is, this was my crack at it. Um, well, I'll, I'll get you on board. We'll do it. We'll, <laughs> well, get, we'll get her on for the uh, sequel. Maybe, maybe, maybe another one. Maybe one more. Um, honestly, uh, for, for television documentaries, it's kind of we're having the same issues that um, the media across the board is having in the United States. There's a lot of consolidation and a lot of... I don't, like, this got funded four years ago from HBO. I don't know if they would do it today. Maybe they'll do it four years from now, but it's not great right now for stories like this. Um, but we're going to keep pitching them and... Well, we're going to help know. you out because we want to watch more and more of this, so well done. Um, I want to end with Patricia, um, because we spoke about legal threats uh, against media, against you, but we know that when institutions are resilient, the law can also be used for you know, what it's meant to be. Um, you sued Bolsonaro, President Bolsonaro, and you won. I want to now show my favorite clip from the entire documentary. Can we please play the next soundbite?
presidente Jair Bolsonaro foi condenado em primeira instância pela Justiça de São Paulo a pagar uma indenização no valor de 20 mil reais da jornalista Patrícia Campos Melo, da Folha de São Paulo. O presidente ainda pode recorrer, mas ainda não obteve resposta. Has he paid you yet? He's appealing. He's appealing, guys. So he hasn't yeah, paid we're yet. We're getting there. What? <laughs> He's still appealing. <laughs> he hasn't paid you yet. He's appealing. Um, but this documentary clearly you know, raised your profile as a journalist in an international crowd such as this one, with more profile, with more, you know, uh, profile raising comes a certain level of protection. We've seen this with Maria Ressa. What's the price, though, that you have to pay it as an individual? You were saying, I'm very private, I want to be a mum. How did you navigate this? Um, I'm going to be brief because I need to speak fast, right? Okay, so... Um, when the, all the harassment threats started, this was 2018, and I stayed quiet for two years, thinking, this is going to go away. If I don't respond, if I don't, you know, I'm not talking about this, I'm not giving interviews, I'm not... And it did not go away. Um, so that's when, when it escalated to all the misogynistic stuff, and I figured, um, people have no idea what's happening. I mean, if it were their you know, daughters, their mothers, their grandmothers that were being targeted with stuff like that. So that's why I, I and the newspaper, we decided to first talk about this. Uh, and that's when I, I accepted to do the documentary. I don't know how you convinced me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, it is, it's true that it gives you an extra layer of protection. But I think nothing, I mean, it's not worth it. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, uh, having, uh, it's just, you know, I just want to do my job, be a reporter, and, and then all of, all of a sudden, you know, people have fake images of you, and, and there, and I have a son, he's 11 now, and my nightmare is that one day he's gonna find one of those, you know, sexual stuff with his mom on the internet, because this is not gonna go away, ever. Ronan, I'm gonna give you the last word. Well, I'd, I'd go back to the point about the positive. You know, that culmination of Patricia's story in the film, I, I hope, is also reflective of how your story continues to unfold in the real world, which is, it does make people want to rally around you. It is clear that you're fighting the good fight. And, you know, that that's not uh, like some glamorized fake portrait of the profession. I'm really proud of how Heidi and Rachel in this film captured the, the tenor of what I think the conversation should be, which is, you know, it's not a profession rooted in heroism, but there is a real aspect of public service to it. And it has really high stakes for all of us and the future of how our rights are protected or abused in our different countries and how the powerful are held to account in our different countries. And so conveying what the human experience of that work is like and coming to a point of, yes, a frank conversation about the challenges, but also understanding why there is so much joy in it and why we, we can and should see more young people get into it and, and with that commitment to doing it right, that's what's going to carry us through the period of challenge in the end. And, I am optimistic right now. It, it, it is fraught with challenges. We have a lot to figure out. We've talked about some of that today. But I do have those conversations all the time with young people. I do see great journalism out there in our countries happening right now. There are a lot of examples of that at this conference in this room. Uh, I think the, the closing sentiment for me is optimism. Keep going. Keep going. I, I believe in it. I know we're in a group of people here who believes in it, and we, we can do this. We can continue to get it right. 
even if it requires toughing it out sometimes. Ronan, Rachel, Patricia, Joel, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.